Hiya and welcome to Build. I'm Daniel Welsh and today I'm live from London with Will Young and Chris Sweeney from the Homo Sapiens podcast. Uh, if you're watching and you're a fan of the podcast, then don't forget that you can get in touch with us at, um, on Twitter at Build Series LDM with any questions you've got. Or if you're watching live on Facebook, drop a comment in the video you're currently watching and we'll do our best to get that to Will and Chris before the end of the interview. Hi guys. Are we live? We're live. live. What, as in like, we're live Is this live. news to you? Listen, I don't know. I just Well, here we go. <laughs> I just walked here. I'm so hot. <laughs> I'm so hot. Why am I wearing this? Why am I wearing a beanie, actually? It's, yeah, it's, 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 I um, imagine that's keeping the warmth in. It's well, a stay good look, hydrated. I can't take it next off 20. now because my hair will look dreadful. It's a strong look. You go with it. The sun will go in. Soon, Commit. Right? Commit to the look. That's, that's what it's okay. all about. Yes. Um, should we chat about Homo sapiens? Go on there. Uh, congratulations on the success of the podcast. You're now into series two, which is very exciting. We are. Can you tell us a little bit that you both are? Huh? Looking very handsome. God. And airbrushed. There's a campaign. If ever I saw one. <laughs> <laughs> we are available for underwear campaigns. Um, um, can you tell me a little bit, just in a nutshell, about the premise of the podcast? Um, it was Chris's fault. It's all his fault. I see. Yeah. We um, both listen to Women's Hour on Radio 4 a lot. And we talk about it a lot. And we were like, oh, no one's done like an LGBTQ plus women's hour where you can just talk about current affairs from an LGBT angle. Um, and so we sat down in my kitchen with my iPhone in the middle of the table and just started recording a conversation about, we just started talking, didn't we? And yeah. that was our first episode. And then from then it's built and grown and now we're on our second season. So it's great. That's amazing. Mm. I feel like right now there's a lot of LGBT issues being discussed in the media mm. and kind of in newspapers, on TV and things like that, but they're not always discussions being had by LGBT people. Was that something that you sort of wanted to correct mm. as well? Uh, yeah, That's interesting, that, isn't I it? Think yeah. I sort of noticed that as we started doing the podcast, yeah. I suddenly realised, well, actually, yeah, it'll be a sort of section within a, a mainstream media, for want of a better you know, um, phrase. Uh, yeah, and I suddenly thought, gosh, it was quite nice to have longer than two minutes. Do you know what I mean? And to or not sometimes be I would, in your corner as well. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And sometimes I would feel like, oh, someone wouldn't have mentioned um, on a radio program same sex partnerships, or you know, whether it's to do with marriage or you know anything they'd be discussing, domestic abuse or you know, sex after being in a relationship for 10 years, all those kind of things. Um, mm. So it has been nice to sort of... I, the, the gauge for me was that we, was the feedback we then started getting, you know, and not just from our mothers. Um, <laughs> and, um, well, that is helpful too. That Neither is helpful, you that they don't listen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> have any of our family members listened? I think my sister actually, listens, my actually. Credit listens. Credit credit's due. Yeah, my brother listens. Oh, that's that's nice. um, uh, that was when it started sort of becoming something a bit other because you know then we we mm. read out what people are saying and there's a kind of there's a community and it becomes a, a conversation it's become a conversation yeah. well that's it and it is yeah. it's kind of an inclusive almost safe space i hate to use that term because it's kind of overused but it is it's a safe space rather than a breakfast tv debate or an afternoon show debate where again it's a just it's a kind of argument rather than just people sharing their yeah, views on both exactly, sides. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, I agree. Just, you find, we've just found common ground with other LGBTQ plus people. You know, like having a funny conversation with um, Helen and Kate Richardson Walsh, the hockey players who are, they're a couple, and saying that people just assume that they are each other's sister. Or when they're house hunting, like they're like, oh, who's getting which room and stuff. And like that happens to, you know, gay men as well. And, you know, it's just, it's just common ground that we've found, and that is really nice. Uh, you've just mentioned those two there. Um, mm. You've had a lot of really impressive guests on over the last two series. Mm. Who have been your favourites, and who's been the most kind of insightful, do you think? John Grant. Mm. John Grant was I amazing. Loved. And he... Um, he was our first guest, wasn't he? <coughs> he was one of our first interviews, yeah. And he, the reaction to that, him being very honest about what he's been through, the reaction to that is incredible. If people come up to us, they always talk about John Grant as being an amazing interview. Um, and then um, Andrew Moffat, who does this thing in schools called No Outsiders, which is about inclusivity in schools, whether that's around um, race, religion, LGBT, everything. Um, that is probably the most inspiring conversation I feel like I've had, but they're all great for different reasons. Um, one of the most high profile, I would say, is Jeremy Corbyn, yes. who is obviously um, a very divisive figure, I would say. Mm. Um, what was that like having him on? It was amazing. I mean, it was 
I felt very fortunate to... Um, oh, someone's fallen over. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's always one. Uh, I felt very fortunate to be able to, you know, speak to him. Um, and as someone that studied politics, I, I, that was quite a thrill. Um, and we didn't ask him... I think our sort of... We had a tactic, I don't know if there was one, but it was just to not sort of... We're not Jeremy Paxman. No. You know, mm. we are not on that level of questioning. So we just spoke about things that were a bit more normal, like jam making. But, you know, who, 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 who knew that, you know, we'd be having a conversation about compost with Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn? Yeah. Do you know what? If, if you leave him for long enough, you'll start talking about it. Do you know he? what I mean? Yeah, yeah I'd heard whispers. <laughs> um, but that was great. But also because, you know, to have... The, it's a sort of a two-pronged uh, attack, if you will, because to have someone like him is high profile, which gets more profile for an LGBTQ plus podcast, you know, and also he's really fascinating to talk to. Yeah, so it was sort of two things that worked really well. And we got to have a nose around Labour headquarters. Was it we headquarters? We did. Their floor Office. in Parliament, yeah. yeah. Did you find anything interesting while you were rummaging? Find. We stole, stole two mugs. Yeah. What did you steal? Stole. Two Labour mugs. Oh, I'm super yeah. into this. Do you yeah. like use them all the time or are they hidden away? They're on eBay. Mm. Uh, no, they're not. Um, yeah. <coughs> Bid still available. Yeah, um, buy it now. No, at three hundred and twenty. Have you got both of them? Shh. You do, don't this you? This is the double steal. I do, have, I do have both of them. I will be returning it to you relatively soon. We thought about taking a statue as well, but it was it was about five feet tall. It was. It's kind of down. harder to be conspicuous with something heavy, isn't it? <laughs> Well, yes, that's true. Baby steps. But we looked around <laughs> their whole floor and they have like, it's a really amazing space up there. Like they have all these posters on the wall. It feels like a really relaxed, doesn't feel like parliament, does it? No, they had all these sayings, like sort of not only positive thoughts beyond this door. I mean, that mm. was on, on, the, uh, on the loo door. Um, <laughs> but yeah. You wrote that. Yeah. Um, you said that like... Scrawled it. You said that like, you're not necessarily going to break into like massive political discussions because that's not really what the podcast is about. Mm. But would you be willing to have other party leaders on? Like, would you be willing to have, say, Theresa May on in the future? Uh, well, um, that is quite a, people, a, a. Lots of people have asked that in terms of balance. Then yeah, like we always want to be balanced. It's not like we're not trying to align with certain people. I don't particularly want to have Theresa May on, but um, <laughs> that's not because of her politics. It's because of her. Would you say? Mm. <laughs> I have to think about that. Okay. Yeah. But we're not a political... I mean, I... Yeah. yeah. Pass. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it is, it's a bit well, no, if we were the BBC, then, of course, you know, you'd, I think it'd have to be balanced. But I don't feel the need to be balanced in terms of... I mean, my, my opinions are my own. You know, that kind of thing. Mm. It's like, I don't feel the need to, to sway up by having a sort of... Lit yeah, something you have... We no, don't come up with I think he's like really interesting there. as a person. I think, you know, like, is Jeremy yes. Corbyn as a person is interesting. I think what he stands for in terms of what's happened within politics, <coughs> you know, who would have thought, um, given the last election, that that would have happened? Um, but I don't feel that Theresa May is, strikes me as a progressive person. You know, perhaps a progressive person within that party as a character would mm -hmm. be interesting. Well, I did want to ask you about kind of Theresa May's voting history as well, because today is um, 30 years since Section 28 was introduced, which um, that's today is the anniversary 30 years. Mm. And Theresa May this morning wrote um, a letter, I believe, to Gay Times, and it was kind of a call to action for how we can make things better for gay and other LGBTQ plus people in Britain. And I was just wondering if you'd seen that and if you had any thoughts on that, because... I she did I vote haven't seen against I mean, repealing Section 28 back in the day. So Yeah, I mean, I just got out of bed, so I haven't seen much. But uh, <laughs> I think it's brilliant that Very she's honest. done that. I didn't really. But um, yeah, I think it's great she's done that. I think it's great. Yeah. I'd like to see it before commenting on it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's probably why. I think it's, <laughs> it's a first. Um, <laughs> on, um, on the subject of Section 28, that's something that I'm guessing you both grew up under. Is that right? Yes. Um, how do you feel about that now looking back? Do you think that that had a big impact on you both when you were at school <coughs> and kind of growing up as teenagers and things? Well, I think looking back on it, I mean, it seems kind of, you know, heinous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, that that could have even happened within the last 30 years, just over, yeah, 30 years. Now. Um, just the same as I was talking to someone the other day, they used to be, you know, caning in schools. <laughs> less than 30 years ago. You know, yeah. all those kind of things. Yeah. The great thing about it is it shows how far um, 
things have progressed um, because I feel like, my gosh, did that really happen? Yeah. Um, you know, like gay marriage. I mean, it's like, were, were people not allowed to be married? You mm -hmm. know? Um, but no, hu hugely damaging. There's still a long way to go within education, I think. You know, homophobic bullying within schools is still um, extremely, I, I think, in terms of the results, results or stats, if you look at mental health, I think it's for young gay uh, boys, you know, so young gay men, let's say, so like teenagers up to early 20s, the suicide rate's almost twice that of heterosexuals. For transgenders, it's almost three times. So, you know, and things like the use of the word gay as a derogatory term, I think, is... is, is instrumental in that actually mm -hmm. I think I, it cannot be good to be at school and hear people going oh, that's so gay that's so wrong basically and you know that you're gay it just mm -hmm. if, and and the and you know um, studies have shown that to be the case that it's that it's not beneficial to people's mental health so there's a long way to go with an education I think the problem is that we sit now and we think for adults oh yeah it's all fine you know let's celebrate we've got everything we need but it's like we're still grossly um, we're we're neglecting our young kids and um, I think that's still going on I'm not sure why but it is we focus so much on the legal rights which is right but we're forgetting that there's just more and more swathes of generations of kids that are still coming up you know being damaged mm -hmm. well that's mm -hmm. again something that I wanted to ask you about in the last say 10 years in terms of legalities and rights <coughs> um, the community has come on a long way but do you think that has actually been reflected in society Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. <coughs> it has. It's it's a really really slow process. We interviewed yeah. Peter Tatchell, and he said that any human rights movement takes fifty years to work, and I think that's what we're in now. Like some people are progressive, some people are not, and you know. So like we're me at the gym. So what? what? Me at the gym. Oh, I want yeah. results in three days, <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. three months. I say Pepe to my old trainer. Um, <laughs> But I think I can give you an example, though. I remember being homophobically abused in Oxford, and um, uh, I employed a tactic that I always wanted to employ, which was to run. Um, <laughs> no, which was to shout out to everyone in the street, uh, these people are calling me whatever they were calling me, and create a stink rather than shrink, mm -hmm. do the opposite. There's a, there's a tagline in that, don't shrink. Stink. And that doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll sleep on it. anyway, the whole street turned on these people. And so, you know, it, I turned the tables on them. And that would not have happened even two years previously. That wouldn't have happened mm. because people would have, it wouldn't have been on the agenda for people to feel that they're like, that's wrong. Yeah, you can't mm. call someone a pufter. You can't call someone a faggot. Mm. You know, so. Um, I think that for me was a litmus test of how far we come. I mean, I wouldn't recommend doing that, you know, every day. <laughs> yeah, you've got to kind of survey the situation. First, I surveyed the you? situation, yeah. 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 We were, yeah, just outside, I think, um, a tea shop or something in Oxford. I thought, okay, well, I might be all right. <laughs> um, you've obviously done a lot of interviews with various people from all walks of life for the podcast. Um, what are the most common shared experiences and what are the biggest things that you've learned? collectively through speaking to people? Um, biggest things we've learned. Well, we've learned to listen, haven't we? Like, you know, because we doing a podcast, like we're there to give people a platform who've done amazing stuff. And so I definitely think we've learned to kind of just shut up and let <laughs> them tell their story. And that's kind of what, and, and then, and, or I have anyway. Um, and... Yeah, so that's what... Uh, what have you learned there, William? I've learned to listen. Yeah, mm, good. Um, have you finished? <coughs> I, uh, <laughs> no. Um, so what else I've learned? Yeah, go on. Um, uh, I've learned to... Uh, I think the shared experiences are, are, the, are things like heartbreak, you know, hmm. um, love, connection, all those kind of things. Honesty. Uh, I, th I suppose... Authenticity, that's been the, the, the people that I've just adored talking to, and they have all been brilliant. Uh, ones that, you know, there's some are just so candid and honest and authentic in themselves. And I just think that that's where true connection comes from. Yeah. Um, so that's through why Chris and I are friends. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Uh, so through speaking to people, what have been like the most common hardships that people have had to overcome like more frequently than others? Oh, that must be mental health. I mean, mental health. There's been a lot so of hard. mental health yeah. discussion, which has been really good and positive and learning from people how they deal with mental health. That's come up a lot, hasn't it? I think that would be, if I think of, of hardships, that would be that. Um, yeah, that's the one that comes up. Um, I can't think of any others. How to boil an egg. Um, <laughs> Episode four. Three minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah, that would be that. Yeah. And pre pre possibly some sort of discrimination, I suppose, along the yeah, way. Yeah, like people's different views of their own discrimination yeah. and some people have dealt with it in different ways and learning about that. And also, I think it's really important to say that what we've learned which we knew anyway, is that, you know, like, we all have common ground. It's not just about LGBT people, it's yeah, for everybody. Course. Like, we all talk about heartbreak is the same for anyone. Um, through speaking to people and hearing their stories, has any of that resonated with you and kind of given you a different perspective on your own experiences as kind of a young gay person? Oh, I, you go, well, oh I've had that as well, and I never really thought about it before. You called us young, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, thank um, you. Gosh, the, for anything but today. Uh, I'd say, well, Mickey Blanco, I thought, was... I'd say he just just turned so many things on its head for me, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think is an example of someone who, perhaps, just listening to him has made me re-look at uh, how I might view things. You know, it makes me look at how I feel, how I'm quite privileged as a gay male white man, mm -hmm. middle class, living in Britain. You know, and I wouldn't have maybe thought about that a year ago. Um, so people like him, I think, have just made me reframed my own experiences and, and how I can look back at my own life and how I see things. So, yeah, yeah. that's what came up for me when you asked. Mm -hmm. And also, we just for the second season, we did a tour of the UK, so like an LGBT tour of the UK, and we wanted to show a really positive... Well, we wanted to see what it was like being LGBT outside of the metropolises. Yeah. And it's important to... You know, I think people think that outside of the cities that it's a bit more backwards and that's not true. And we wanted to show that. And that's what we discovered from talking to people. Um, and I think I've just learned a lot about like the positivity of, you know, someone like Andrew Moffat, the teacher who has organized this entire scheme to get inclusivity happening in schools. He's just one guy. Obviously, mm -hmm. he has a support network, but that's incredible, you know. Well, actually, on that note, was that an important thing for you both when you started the podcast, making sure that things were framed in a positive light. And yes, there are, you know, people struggle with their mental health and people do face discrimination. But I feel like so often, if you read statistics about being gay or being LGBTQ, it's like, it's a depressing read. You get to the finish mm. and you think, oh God. Whereas, you know, a lot of people are kind of fighting this sort of stuff and they've come up with solutions. It's not all problems, it is solutions. And did you want to mm. frame that as well? I think it's, I, I, maybe it's just the way we both are. I mean, I think it's just, about well this is this and this is that you know ra rather than being sort of debbie downer you know that would mm. be not that much fun for us to be honest to sit yeah. there and read out a load of you know so you can do an episode on shame for example which we did with matthew todd um who wrote a book um called straight jacket great book um and that's a heavy topic mm -hmm. but because you know I, th I think we yeah we really wanted to do that because mm. gay shame actually comes up a lot um, mm. However, we're not going to sit there for an hour and be like, oh, God, I, I feel gay shame. You know, it's like, let's just treat this how we treat our everyday life, which is like, gosh, that's tough. Oh, that, by the way, this is really funny today. You know, and I think that's the yeah. way to treat um, any topic it has to be light and shade. Yeah. 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 Just d d deal with it as you would normally in conversation. You don't talk in, you don't often have very serious conversations about serious stuff. People actually make quite a lot of jokes about serious stuff, you know, and then that's how we just end up talking about things. There wasn't actually an intention there. We just started talking and recording it and then it came yeah. out and lots of people like, it seems that we are a bit more conversational about heavy stuff. Which, I, I, you know, it's like life, isn't it? Like you said, you have to have light and shade and things. Yeah. Um, Will, I wanted to ask you, you obviously are best known as a pop star My outfit, and yes. wearer of fabulous dunkarees, evidently. <laughs> um, and you mm. came out fairly early on in your career in terms of things. Right and, at the beginning. Um, right at the beginning. Mm. And that was quite an uncommon thing at the time. And there's a lot of conversation about representation and visibility. Do you think that um, 
why is that so important, basically? N now? Yeah. Or th um, well, now and then. Well, then, yeah, it wasn't really... I mean, again, that seems weird. I mean, it was 16 years ago, and that seems weird that there wasn't really that many pop stars out. Especially at any? that early stage. Hardly any. Hardly any. Um, at that early stage, yeah, from the beginning, mm -hmm. it's exactly now. It would be seen as career suicide. Now it's... Who cares? Um, uh, now, visibility... I think within pop, it doesn't. I don't get a sense that it's as much as a problem. I know that the people that we we work with that look at things like festivals um, and um, live dates. So Smirnoff, who um, are our brand partners, they do a lot of work with festivals to make sure that the people are on the bills. It's for the bills are very inclusive, and the festivals that they want to sponsor do have an inclusivity and I think that's brilliant so and I'm not saying that because there are brand partners it's because you know it's because actually that's what came up in my head yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think now I'm more interested in across the board in media in general so um, all male game shows panel panel shows and all those kind of things mm. you know uh, women in comedy um, you know all, all, all that kind of thing so I think in pop we probably probably been slightly sheltered dare I say I think there's other arenas where it could go within the news you know um, news anchors all that kind of stuff yeah um, yeah that's where I'd like to see more inclusivity and obviously you came out in an interview with the sun which I believe was you were going to be outed or something it, was it the sun it was a newspaper I it was the sun I it think, was yes. I think it was a Sunday newspaper yes um, it was. and yes. there was a I was going to be out yes, yeah by the Sunday a, mail yes but oh, right. I went oh, with that right the, yes keep us right please thank you um and then obviously more than a decade later Tom Daly had the exact same thing George Shelley had the exact same thing and then even recently we had the Brexit whistleblower as well um are you surprised that this sort of thing is still going on what that they were that were they outed? Was Tom Daly outed? He was, it was threatened to be outed. Oh, right. That. Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, it's just... I really hope it doesn't happen now, does it? I mean, it's just like... I, do, I would hope it, it wouldn't happen? happen now. I think if you did that to somebody, I think everyone would turn against the publication who did it, wouldn't you say? I feel like they would now, and I think that's interesting, because when did, when did Tom Daly say publicly that he was gay? I think it was 2014, 2013. End of 2013. Gosh, yeah. I mean, it doesn't that see that feels weird to me? We yeah. really have come on so far. I I don't know if a paper could do it now, but maybe it does all go on in the background. Um, I just don't like it when people say so and so admits he's <laughs> gay or <laughs> she's she admits she's bisexual or something. I'm hoping that word has kind of gone now. Mm. It is. It's such a, It's again. It's a really small thing, but it's loaded, isn't exactly, it? Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that. But those are the telltale signs of of where people are at. You know, you've got to let those are the telltale signs when people, some people might go, oh, no, no, we're really progressive. We don't care. And it's like, well, you've just used that language. Mm. You know? um, quickly getting back to homo sapiens. Um, through speaking to people, are there any issues uh, people in the community are facing that you don't think are getting enough attention right now? Uh, for me, it's, it's homophobic bullying and the misuse and misappropriation of language in schools. There's not enough. At, there's, there's, it's, it's an epidemic. And government don't seem to be wanting to do much about it. I know they say they are, but they're not. But then I am like the person that wants to have the beach body in three months, not three years. <laughs> we all do, though, to be fair. Well, just do something about it, Chris. Mm. Um, <laughs> but you know, like those <laughs> poor... <laughs> as a member of government. kids, yeah. those poor kids, it breaks my heart. That's my big one. Um, yeah, and I think loneliness is something that comes up a lot with listeners writing in saying, I feel very isolated as an LGBTQ plus person where I live this is a nice way for me to feel like I'm part of a community. So I think that loneliness is a big thing that we hopefully are addressing in our own way, not that we could solve it in any way, but it's nice to know that it connects with people. What would be your advice to somebody who was feeling that way? Uh, Other than listen to Homo sapiens, of course. Well, there's a lot of um, sort of groups that you can join, LGBTQ plus groups all up and down the country, and they can be a brilliant resource for meeting face to face with other people who are like you in your local area. Amazing. Mm. Um, and let me ask you both, who would be the LGBTQ people that you looked up to and that continue to look up to? That's well, we hard. both very, very much, you know, Peter Tatchell and the work that he's done yeah, is, was a oh, huge well, hero of ours and we were like very honored that he did our podcast. When I was young, because I, I paused because I can't think of people when I was young because the visibility was 
really minimal. genuinely not there. It was minimal. Yeah. Mm. Um, no, I would definitely echo that with Peter Tatchell. He's a, I'd say he's an unsung hero. Yeah. I was just going to say, are there any other undersung heroes that you could mention that either you've had on the podcast or would like to have on the podcast in the future? Ooh. Well, I know I've said him a lot, but Andrew Moffat and the work that he does, I just think he's amazing in this, in this country. It's incredible. Oh, my God, there's so many. I can't, now I'm having that famous, famous thing of like having a complete blank. Can't think mm. of one. And then my dogs. Just say yourself, yeah. They're unsung heroes. I mean, the heroes of the podcast are the dogs. Or our Very dogs. True. Is there yeah. a, a talk of a spin off at all? I, I worry because I think they. W- really? Do you think we could yeah, do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They might, they might eclipse us. <laughs> yes. People that is the worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note, besides a canine spin off, uh, mm. what is next for Homo sapiens? Is there plans for another series or anything else that you might have in the pipeline? Yeah, yeah third absolutely. series. We're just sort of um, gathering. Uh, ourselves to think about that it's quite exciting we want to do more travels hopefully mm-hmm. um, and a few other bits and pieces um, we can't talk about our project gaze in space because that's um, <laughs> that's very much on the down low at the moment can I yes. please be involved in that in some yes, way yes you can we're going to make we our own rocket are. launcher out of loo roll yeah. and some sort of elastic band contraption mm. <laughs> sensational be firing what could go wrong no, absolutely nothing <laughs> um, how can we listen to Homo Sapiens, by the way, before we go? Well, it's available on Apple. all your oh. podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Acast, or you can go to homosapienspodcast.com and listen to it there. You Chris, see, thank you so much. We've got I'm this not good pack. at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen to it. I'm not good at that. It bit. exists. Yeah. All right, well, listen to Chris, do all of those things. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for, but please give it up one more time for Will Young and Chris Sweeney from Homo Sapiens, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.